Hi everyone, and welcome to Eric's Electronics Workbench. So today I have this Sharp EL8 vintage handheld calculator, and this is one of the earliest mass-produced handheld calculators, and it was Sharp's first handheld calculator that they introduced to the market. Now back in the day when this sold, around 1970 to 71, it listed for 345 US dollars. So now as of 2025 when I'm making this video, that equates to about $2,680. So it was very expensive back in the day when this was manufactured. So I think it'd be interesting to open up the calculator and look at the early type of uh, you know, circuitry and electronics that were used in this calculator, and then see what it takes to actually power it up and make it work. So again, as of 2025 and making this video, the calculator is 54 years old, or you know, right about that age. Now, something that I noticed on this calculator is that when you touch these keys, they have a very nice tactile feel. And you know, modern calculators, they use a, like a rubber membrane that has a little carbon button and it touches the traces on a circuit board. These keys actually are a little bit more mechanical in the mechanism that's underneath, and they actually are a, a magnet that's moving and it activates a reed switch. So a reed switch is a type of a switch that moves the contacts when a magnet is brought nearby. So again, they have a very nice tactile feel, and all of the buttons, keys, you know, they do work okay. None of them are stuck. So hopefully the reed switches are also working okay. Now something that's very noticeable on these calculators when they're turned on is the display. So it uses a vacuum fluorescent display. That's a very common type of technology for a display. But the, uh, the numerals or the digits are almost like a handwritten style, and they were known as an itron tube, and they use a very unusual half-height zero. So they have a very unique look when they're actually turned on. Very different than the seven-segment type display that we're familiar with nowadays. So you can see, of course, when I pick up the calculator, you know, it does fit in the palm of your hand, but much larger than any calculator you would find nowadays. But back in the day when this was manufactured, you know, a calculator this size is definitely cutting edge technology. You know, prior to this calculator, uh, you know, they were basically desktop models that were much larger, not something that was meant to be portable. This was supposed to have NICAD batteries in it, or it could be used with an AC adapter. So completely portable, not exactly something you'd put in your pocket, but again, something you could take with you. And prior to, you know, electronic desktop type calculators, you'd be using a, a you know, mechanical adding machine. Now, if we take a look at the back of the calculator right here, some marks on the back right here. So it says right here, use model EL81 only. So I think that's referring to the power adapter that you're supposed to use. You can see this connector right here, this receptacle. So it has three little pins in there. Of course, I don't have this power adapter and I don't have any plug that will fit in here. So, you know, we'll have to see what we can do to power this up. But again, it is supposed to use NICAD batteries inside or, you know, internally. So maybe we can clip onto the area where those batteries were originally installed and be able to power up the calculator that way. We'll have to take a look. And right here it mentions uh, 8.7 volts DC and 9.6 volts DC. So I think that was the rating of probably this uh, you know, power adapter. So I'm only seeing this one screw right here. I don't see any other screws you know, around the case. And the case is in very nice condition. No cracks or damage or anything. Switch on the side right there. AC off and DC. I turn that a little bit there. You can see down into the display. But of course we'll hopefully be able to power it up and we'll have a better look at the display. So the display is created by, there's individual tubes, so it's not one large piece of glass for the vacuum fluorescent display, it's individual display tubes. All right, so let me grab a Phillips screwdriver right here and see what we can do here. I think again, just this one screw and we should be inside. Go. Yep, it comes apart there. All right. Yeah, so it has these little tabs on the back here. So definitely don't want to cause any damage to this back edge right here on the case. You know, if you pry that, you could end up cracking that case. So again, the case is in very good condition. You know, it's held up very well over all the years. Wow. Oh, look at that. So. Quick look around here. So you can see the a connector right here. So these circuit boards, look, they're plugging into this connector right here. And this has uh, connections that go down to this other board right here, which is where the key uh, switches are, the keypad. 
You know, look at all the traces on the board there. Very nicely laid out. So this connector here, this must have gone to, I'm guessing, the battery pack, but uh, I was expecting to see more of a holder or something for the battery pack. I suppose it probably sat right in here, but um, maybe, you know, maybe it just rested in there. I don't really see anything else. But probably just be able to connect you know, the power supply right to this connector and uh, maybe be able to power up the calculator that way. So let me see if I can take these boards out of here and have a better look at the components that are on those circuit boards. All right, so here's the circuit board that we already saw the backside traces on. So the edge of the board right here plugs into this edge connector right here. So yeah, look at those very early designs of integrated circuits, all sharp branded. And you know, compare this to a modern calculator that just has a little blob chip on the circuit board. So very, very different design back in the day. So this board contains all of the microprocessor, the memory, the logic, switching control, and so forth. And I'm seeing this electrolytic capacitor right here is a Nichicon brand, so that's a very good brand, but hopefully that capacitor is held up well enough to still work because the capacitor that's going on over 50 years old is typically on its way out, probably doesn't quite have the ratings that it should has a high ESR and maybe some leakage and things like that going on, but hopefully it still works well enough to try out the calculator. And there's a ceramic disc capacitor right here, and it's a little bit discolored. It has some kind of a white discoloration on it, but I think that's just a wax coating that has discolored just a little bit, so the capacitor is probably okay. All right, so I removed the screw that went through each of these plastic tabs, and it went into the metal part of the chassis over here, and it let the entire part of the calculator come out of that other plastic, uh, you know, top cover. So now we have a much better view of that vacuum fluorescent display, or I should say the individual displays. There we go. You can see each one is a separate tube, and you have a little bit better idea of how the segments inside the display are formed. Get the light just right there. So again, each of those is a separate indicator tube. There's also a vacuum fluorescent display up here. And I think this red dot right there is probably just an incandescent bulb. So you can see the keypad assembly right there. So it looks like, I think if I take this screw maybe right here out and another one on the other side, that this board here plugs into an edge connector, and I think this will you know, separate apart. We can see a little bit more inside because there are integrated circuits that are going to be the drivers for these uh, vacuum fluorescent displays and you can see them down inside right here. It's pretty dark, so I'd like to have a better look at those. And if uh, we can get this apart a little bit further, you know, we'll be able to see just a little bit better. All right, so check this out. So there's a screw right on this side here and on this side over here on this keypad assembly. I just loosened those a little bit and they go through this plastic piece right here. And by loosening that, then I was able to unplug the edge of this board from this edge connector back here. So this board and this whole main assembly slid out of this keypad assembly. So very modular construction the way all of this comes apart. I think it'd be a good idea to clean these edge connectors just a little bit with a contact cleaner, just very, very carefully while everything's apart. Probably would be a, a good thing to do to make sure that there's a you know, good connection when it's reassembled. So now, with this disassembled a little bit further, we can see this touched up there. You can see those, those are the uh, display drivers. Try to get that any closer. There it goes. Let's see back in there where the bottom of each vacuum fluorescent tube comes out and the wire leads come down to the circuit board.
And then if we take a look at the keypad assembly right here, so I'll just take this key, if I press that, see how that is lifting that magnet up right there? So the magnet is right on this side of the key, okay, right, on, right there. So you have this uh, kind of shiny silver piece right here, and then the magnet is a little square block right there. And then the reed switch is right over here, and it's soldered to the circuit board. So when the magnet is moving in the upwards direction as I press the key, then it's activating that reed switch. Right, so I'm not sure if I can really disassemble this too much further. There's some more electronics back in here. It looks like the, the uh, power supply section, um, but I'm not entirely sure that this will come apart all that easily, and I don't want to damage the calculator in any way. So I'll take a closer look, but if I can't really disassemble this any further to really see inside of there any better, uh, then I think it's time to start putting things together and we'll try and power it up. All right, so I put the calculator back together. There really wasn't anything else to look at. There's a circuit board on the front edge that's sort of underneath the display. It's basically the power supply section, best that I can tell. It looks like a power inverter. It looks like there's a coil on it, so probably a you know, step up for some voltage that drives the vacuum fluorescent displays and things like that, but really not all that interesting or unique. So the calculator is back together, except it's not in the case. It's still out in the open, but all the boards and everything are plugged together. And we'll go back down to that in just a moment. So now let's set up the power supply so that we can try and power up the calculator. So I'm not entirely sure what the operating voltage should be. Again, it's a NICAD battery pack, and I think it used six NICAD batteries, but we'll start at a lower voltage and, and kind of work up from there. I don't want to apply too much voltage to start with. So we use my Keithley DC power supply here. Get this started up. So let's say for the output voltage, let's go uh, voltage, say five volts. And we'll do a current limit. Let's say, yeah, we don't want three amps. Let's go with uh, 200 milliamps, 0.2 amps. So essentially, if there's a major short circuit or an overload, you know, it will current limit at just 200 milliamps. I think it should draw well under that when it's in normal use. All right, and then I'll just connect the test leads right here. And go ahead and turn the output on, like so. All right, so now let me move you back down to the calculator and let's see what happens. All right, let's try and power up the calculator and see what happens. So this wire that you see kind of floating along on the side over here was just connected to the metal frame. And I don't believe this has anything to do with, you know, the power supply. I think it's just a shield that's around the frame. So we'll leave that disconnected for now. Now on this connector right here, I noticed that there is a plus and minus symbol. The red is positive and the black is negative. And that's the typical color coding you would expect. So what I'll do is just take the black wire and connect it right here. So, and then the switch needs to be in the forward position. So that's the DC voltage, which would be the internal batteries. Again, the power supply is set to five volts. So I'll just touch this wire right here and see what happens. No activity yet. Oh, there we go. How about that? So I think the voltage is too low, but it did turn on and the current draw wasn't too excessive. So I'll go up to say six volts, let's try that. There we go. Hey, look at that. So there it goes. Now six volts still may not be quite enough voltage. In fact, the display doesn't look like it's evenly lit. It looks, to my eye anyways, a little bit dimmer over there on that digit. But you can see that half height zero I was mentioning it's a very unusual type of display and the characters and the way that they're drawn out. So let me increase that voltage a little bit more. Uh-oh, I think we lost connection there. My test lead came loose. There it goes. So I'll go up to say seven volts. Let's try that. 
Okay, so that cleared that indicator that was up at the top. The display looks more evenly lit now. I don't know if it was showing up on the camera the other way, but again, some of the digits looked a little bit unevenly lit. But that looks pretty good now, so still may not be quite enough voltage, but uh, it's drawing 100 milliamps, 0 0.104 at 7 volts. So let me just tip this up a little bit here like this, and you can see that display a little better. So, three, six, seven, eight. So you can see how those digits are drawn, very uh, like a handwritten type uh, style. Again, definitely different than a seven segment display or even an alphanumeric display. And let me get you zoomed in a little closer here and you can see that a little better. Clear that again. There's the nine. Seven, six, five, four, three, two. So let's say, okay, one plus one is two. Can't argue with that. It looks like it's working. Now this has this unusual combination where you have a, a negative and an equal, the multiplication and division, and the plus and equal all in the same key. So that works a little bit different than a modern calculator, this combination of functions over here. But yeah. It looks like it's functioning correctly. Yeah, four times four, 16. So how cool is that? Yeah, that, that is really neat. Really like that display. It has such a unique look to it. Those characters, the way that they're drawn. It looks like half of it's missing. You know, those zeros take a little bit of use to, you know, getting, uh, looking at them and getting used to it. That, that style because it looks like an eight where the top of the eight is gone. But again, the eight, you know, how it looks there. Put that on the display, you can see how the different segments light up. So very cool. So if this had an internal battery pack, you know, it really would be functional and, and useful again. So I have to look in to see, you know, what I could do about getting an internal battery pack uh, put into the calculator, something that would make it, um, you know, that could be used again. The way that it is now with that external connector here, I'm not sure what the pinout function is on that connector. So, you know, getting to this internal connector requires, of course, that the calculator be completely disassembled like this. So uh, I have to do some investigation on that uh, input and see if there's something that can be done to power it directly from what used to be, I think, the battery charger and the power supply. But uh, the basics, you know, are all working correctly. So, 54-year-old uh, calculator is still functioning and still useful. All right, so if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. It lets me know that you enjoyed the video as well. And it also helps it place just a little bit better in YouTube's rankings. And if you're enjoying the videos on this channel in general, don't forget to subscribe. There'll be many more videos coming up in the near future. Lots and lots of projects in the queue. In fact, just to my right of the camera, there's another project that is completely disassembled. I'm just waiting on a replacement part to arrive for that project. So that video will be coming up very, very soon. So tap that bell symbol to be notified when I do post a new video. All right, until next time, take care, and as always, thank you for watching. Goodbye for now.